This week on Security and Compliance Weekly, we introduce you to our new show in the Security Weekly Network, which is Security and Compliance Weekly. I'm your host, Jeff Mann. Today, we're gonna to talk about the highlights of the recent PCI community meeting where they introduced a sneak preview of what's to come in PCI version 4.0. In our second segment, we are going to discuss news of the week in the world of security and compliance. Stay with us, we'll be right back. This is a Security Weekly production. And now, it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security. Your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. Today's organizations face an evolving set of security threats and continually changing compliance requirements. As your business grows, privacy concerns only multiply and add to a dynamic set of priorities. Today's organizations need to integrate risk, security, and privacy into a cohesive program. Online Business Systems team of seasoned security practitioners work closely with you to assess your security posture, policies, procedures, and technologies, providing tailored solutions that are specifically aligned to your business's risk profile and ultimately ensure the protection of your brand. To learn more about online business systems, go to securityweekly.com forward slash online. Hi, this is your host of Security and Compliance Weekly, Jeff Mann. I, uh, I think I talked about PCI so much on Security Weekly that they finally put me in a corner and gave me my own show. Uh, we, so we did, here we are. With, with constraints. With constraints. <laughs> <laughs> so we're starting out a new show. This is episode one of Security and Compliance Weekly. We're here in studio to kick off this inaugural segment with all of our co-hosts. I'd like to introduce who are going to be the co-hosts for Security and Compliance Weekly. To my left, the CEO of Security Weekly, Mr. Matt Alderman. Hello, everybody. Yes, I do. I've done compliance in my days. We're going to talk GRC and IRM and a couple of the news segments today, so it'll be interesting. A uh, little blast from the past, so it's fun to kind of bring all that together in this new show. A blast from the past, and yet it doesn't seem to go away. It doesn't. Which is no. why we're doing a whole show right, on right. it, right? Which is, well, that's what happens with regulations. That's Once right. they start, they rarely end. That's right. Also in the studio, uh, our new co-host. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Scott Lyons. Scott, please introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, hi, everybody. Scott Lyons. Uh, I'm the CEO of Red Lion. Uh, we're a small information security company out of Maryland. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, that's and tell us your favorite color. <laughs> oh, and geez. I'm guessing it's blue. It 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 it, it I has thought it was red. <laughs> it has been blue. It has been blue at times. Usually it is blue. Gotcha. Okay. Also with us in the studio, Mr. Josh Marpet. Josh, introduce yourself. Hi, Josh Marpet. Uh, let's see, Chief Operating Officer of Red Lion. Uh, I'm the guy in the funny hat and the loud voice you see at conferences. And I've uh, been around the block more than once. Compliance is fun. We talk about compliance, and we're going to talk about compliance for the U.S., Europe, uh, Asia, Africa, uh, every continent except Antarctica, probably. So we'll have a lot of fun with that. Unless we feel like we shouldn't be exclusive and we want to include Antarctica. They have very little compliance regulation there, didn't they but just we can get, make it happen. Didn't they just get an ATM there? Like they, they have they two, did two actually, ATMs? But if it's a Bitcoin ATM, then we can talk compliance. Yes. <laughs> we can have some fun. So for our inaugural episode, uh, we decided, uh, because it just happened a week ago, the PCI community meeting for North America, uh, I was tasked with providing basically a trip report. Um, the PCI community meeting is an annual event. It's always kind of weird to me because it's an opportunity for assessors to get together, which is my a good portion of my past. I was a QSA for 10 years. I'm sorry. Uh, and yet, when I get there, there's always so many different people there that are doing so many different things with this, within this umbrella of PCI, yet they're more focused on sort of the product side of things, point of sale systems, mm -hmm. card readers, pin pads. So lots of talk about encrypting this and encrypting that and reducing scope here and reducing scope there. Uh, but it's also a chance to meet fellow QSAs, comrades. Uh, there was a bunch of people from my company there, my company online business systems. Um, so it's a, a chance to catch up with people. Uh, and it's also a chance to find out what's new and what's different in PCI. It, it's also a chance for the QSAs to understand the frequently unanswered <laughs> questions. There is that. We'll, <laughs> we'll get to that. 
um, the highlight, I guess, uh, what what was most interesting about the week, uh, well, the couple days of the conference, was they gave a sneak preview of the much-anticipated PCI Data Security Standard version 4. Now, <laughs> they, uh, they haven't released it yet, but they are getting ready to release a draft. In fact, they're going to release it sometime in October of 2019. And uh, they gave a presentation on what's what's new and what's different, what we what we can expect to see from PCI version four. Would you like to hear about it? Yes, uh, new stuff, changes, deletions, all of the above. All of the above. Um, one thing that I've learned over the years uh, in in going to these meetings and and getting previews of the new versions of the data security standard co that come out. Uh, I've always, over the past years, when version you know, 1.2 came out, and then later 2, and version 3, and so forth, um, there was always a lot of expectation for lots of change, and then always great disappointment that largely the structure of the standard didn't change. And you know, I, like many people, were frustrated about that for many years, but then kindly, I, I kind of figured out eventually, okay, there must be a method to the madness. And they sort of addressed that in the introduction to version four where they said, while they're making some significant changes, the overall structure of the, the data security standards not changing. Uh, Which means 12 core segments still, still exist. Still core 12 requirements, okay. yes. 12 core kind of, I they guess families of controls. To, to yeah, and, and if you, and I don't disagree with that because if you treat it as a framework and you know what are the <laughs> things that you do in a security program, they pretty much, stand intact you know there are things that you do to do a security program in an organization so they have this sort of philosophical high-level framework approach what they are promising a lot of change to is a they're going to renumber everything which is always ah, drives everybody crazy which means we'll have blog posts upon blog posts of mapping three to four yep, and yep. previous versions and yeah but in the core of things mm -hmm. as a business owner as a, as a qsa as a whatever why do I care? That's a great question. Not about the renumbering, but what, right. what, what changes were made that I care about? Well, funny you should ask. So this is what they advertise. And, and they caveated, and I will extend the caveat, that um, this is in draft form, mm -hmm. subject to change, subject to approval. In fact, one of the things that they advertised is they're going to go through not one, but two more review cycles. They did it in initial, hey, uh, what would you like to see change? Is that and normal? That Multiple review cycles like that for? Q no, it's not. Okay. Uh, it's usually one. Yeah, that's what I usually thought. it's just one review cycle, but they're promising okay. two review cycles, and I think partially it's because they're making such, in their minds, significant changes to ah. to the standard this year. Oh. Um, why you care as an organization is, and I, and I think there's good news in this for you. Uh, they've tried to address, I think, some. Uh, key sore spots or sore points for people. Not the least of which is, uh, and this happened in the last year, year and a half or so, when NIST published new guidance on passwords right. that sort of directly contradicted or were in right. conflict with what PCI requires. And we'll be covering everything at NIST uh, in a couple episodes, by the way. And probably Ongoing, mm -hmm. of yes. course, yeah, yeah, because <coughs> this is going to go through similar changes and revisions. everything does, yeah, everything, everything does. will. Now they didn't go into the details of exactly what's going to change. They just said they are changing. They are taking into account the NIST guidance for passwords. What they effectively said, or what I heard, subject to all the caveats and everything, was disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Um, <laughs> I think what they're leaning towards is. Uh, an acknowledgement that if you're using much longer, stronger, more robust passwords, password generators, password you know key ma you know password managers, managers things yeah, yeah. like that, you could probably not have to do the reset every 90 days. Okay, mm. not saying that's going to be in there, but that's sort of what they were leaning towards, especially when you take into account that in many uh, instances within the card data environment you're now required to do multi-factor authentication. So they all but said, if you're doing multi-factor authentication, we're gonna relax a lot on the standard password rules for the primary so is authentication. MFA required now? MS or is it MFA option? is required now for certain access. Certain, okay. Um, Admin access, I think? I'm working from memory. 
um, any non-console access into a system, yep. administrative or otherwise, requires multi-factor authentication. If you're going from outside the CDE into the CDE. What is CDE? CDE is cardholder data environment, okay. which is PCI language for what we care about. Right. <laughs> the scope. The scope. <laughs> <laughs> the scope. <laughs> what we um, care about. <laughs> yeah. A anybody that's trying to log in from outside in is required to to use multi-factor multi authentication. It used to be in earlier versions, it was if you were just remotely logging into your network and you know, you're know you at home and you're logging into your company, you have to do multi-factor authentication. And they sort of they sort of clarified <coughs> that to not just into your organization, but into the card data environment. Right, because if you're segmenting your network to cardholder data environment and non-cardholder data, um, what they really care about is where the cardholder data stuff is, right? Well, so that's part of it. They yeah. care about that. They care about systems with access to that. Correct. Yep. They care about, so there's, there's, there's CDE and then there's CDE adjacent, which is something that we've been pushing on, on companies because it's systems that have access to the CDE, systems that are relevant to the CDE, API connected to the CDE, et cetera. Yeah, because the CDE is bound to the rock or the rules of compliance, right? Well, yes, it's, it's the CDE is, the, is where the data is. But there's other systems that have access to it that are not necessarily inside the CDE. Right. Yeah. So there's there it's it's becoming and, and part of this I think about the passwords. This is interesting, is because of the deperimeterization mm -hmm. of the networks. You're now seeing that that is extending inside. It's not just that there's no perimeter anymore. It's right. that my network is becoming fuzzier. I think is a good term. Yeah. And your so perimeter is definitely fuzzier. Your perimeter is just poof gone. Have right. A nice day. Pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. And you have all these third-party connectors into these environments, in and out of the environments, right? Oh, yeah, to huge. make some of these systems work, they're all over the place, right? And so that adjacency and that interconnectivity, and as we see applications continue to get more decentralized, which potentially are also housing cardholder data, those or all have it, using right, it, processing all it, have to come into it. scope in some right, right. form or factor, right? If Plus, you're not talking about things that are multi-regulatory, uh, under multi-regulatory regimes, where, where cardholder data is also PII, and so now you've got things, okay, I've got to deal with PCI, but PCI is not the be-all and end-all. There are other regulatory regimes, and I might have to, uh, you said that they're, they're paying attention to NIST. Yep. So whether they're reacting to it, working with it, dealing with it, something like that, these other regimes are starting to cross over into yep. uh, each other. So it's, I just wanted to put that in as a side so note. So let me, let me ask this question then. Would putting sure. a ring model on the cardholder data environment be a good thing? Like ring, ring zero, ring one, ring two? Oh, I thought you were talking about an engagement ring. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, you know, come on. Are you trying to commit to a long-term relationship with <laughs> the no. card data environment? I, 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 get, I, get, I get the jokes. I get it. But uh, what I'm well, saying is... we don't is get what you're asking. You're, you're so talking about levels of in. trust, right? Levels, yes. Well, it could be levels of trust. It could be levels of compliance. It could levels be... Levels of security. It, it could be levels of security. It could also be levels of connection, mm -hmm. right? So ring zero being those, those the all, main those environment, all. ring one being uh, the, con the, the ins and outs of the environment, and ring, you know. The problem is it's not as clear cut as that. If you've got a, a, a Lambda function, a serverless environment or whatever, that, that, that springs up to do one piece of data processing and then another one goes, it's like. I, I, yeah, but then you're talking about, you're talking about cloud maturity models to be put on top that's of it. A and that's a whole different world. That's but a yeah, whole other so subject. I'm curious about aspects of that. I mean, you, mm -hmm. obviously we're talking passwords, authentication, multi-factor. Yep. Yep. It is definitely um, interesting, right? With the NIST guidance changes, how does that impact the, the PCI DSS from that perspective, which we're on? Mm -hmm. I'm curious where they're going to go with some of these new technologies like cloud, how they're going to handle... Uh, applications that are highly distributed with a lot of API connectivity. I, I'm curious how, how those so, come in. So cloud was something that they called out specifically. They had they had a slide on cloud. They acknowledged it? They acknowledged it. It, it exists to them now. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, and, and again, not a whole lot of detail, but okay. what they basically said was, because they get a lot of questions, does, you know, how do we deal with cloud? You know, does does PCI DSS apply to cloud? If we're outsourcing to a cloud provider, the answer is all, yes. And the answer is yes. They if it's part of your yes. cardholder data environment, the answer has to be yes. The question is, what types of controls above and beyond mm -hmm. the cloud providers are they now going to look at enforcing for PCI DSS compliance? See, right. I think that's the interesting part because. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we've had a lot of questions on Enterprise Security Weekly about mm -hmm. 
cloud security and and where what does cloud do to my security controls what's what do the cloud providers do in the shared responsibility model what things do you have to do above and beyond on your own right so we we did this kind of matrix it talked about the different levels of potential controls that an organization still has to own you did the pizza restaurant right kind no no i didn't but similar yeah okay. I, I mean I, I made it a little more specific uh than the pizza analogy but what we were trying to really understand was the cloud providers own a certain level depending on the type of cloud service you're using infrastructure as a service has a lot more requirements on the on the company the organization than a platform or a true SaaS, right because a lot of that gets abstracted away so i think clarification from the pci council mm -hmm. on those additional types of controls and they almost have to get a little specific i think because more than a little <laughs> because IaaS is way different than PaaS or Function or, or uh, software as a service. And then you start doing multi-cloud maturity, and when you start doing uh, inter interoperable data loads and workloads and workflow uh, across multiple different cloud service providers, CSPs, and then when you start talking about the fact that you've got one department of your company doing this and another department doing that, and they're interacting with certain pieces of data, the only way that PCI can stay relevant is because they're tightly controlling what they care about. They're tightly controlling. It's the pan. It's it's the card data itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the it, what is it? Uh, it's the name, the pan, the CVV, CVV two, etc. Mm -hmm. They've very tightly controlled the data. They very tightly circumscribed their scope. That's the only way they can stay relevant, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a good way. Don't get me wrong. But between all the different ways that we're outsourcing everything under the sun, I mean, we we've talked to clients that have thousands of third party vendors. Thousands. Yeah, and they have no control over them. Uh, they have mm -hmm. very, you know, it, very, it's very little control. Very little control over yeah, the besides, data they're touching. Besides signing a paper that says, "Yeah, we're not going to tell, we're not going to tell people about your secrets." So the only way that PCI stays as strong as it does is because it's very tightly circumscribing the pieces of data that they care about. Yeah. But the the problem is the interactions with other types of data, other types of functions, gets ugly fast. Yeah. Well, and that's. You know, love or hate PCI, that's where I think PCI, at least in my experience over the years, has really made it stand out from any other regulatory standard because they are actually, this is the data that you care about. This is what you need to protect rather right. than whatever your data is. You you decide yeah. and pr apply all these protections. Well, 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 by defining well said, scope, well very well but, said. but by defining the scope of the data to protect, mm -hmm. they can also then prescribe a set of controls on the best way to protect aspects of that environment versus if you look at a privacy regulation we'll get into private privacy discussions on on later episodes oh dear god yes right where <laughs> it, they all vary they're all over the board is yep. an email uh pii is an ip address pii right i mean in EU, it gets really crazy about... Actually, in the U.S., it gets really crazy. Even well, just it, in the U.S., the state laws that are coming up, there's there's uh, 49, I think, mm -hmm. uh, breach mm -hmm. disclosure laws and notification laws, yeah. and they all have different definitions of what's a breach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what's just, PII, too. Yeah, right? but getting well, back same idea. to data classification... Yeah, right? same idea. Data classification. You would, not, you would not believe the number of businesses that we've run into that don't even know... Yeah, what data classification is, let alone where Actually, to start. Actually, I, I I would believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I would because I've seen it too. Because most companies that I've dealt with, they have two classifications: data they care about, it's company confidential, and it's a big, huge bucket. Yep. Right. And then there's the stuff Everything. that they All don't the public care data. about. So it's almost it's almost like a startup medium enterprise mentality of you know here's everything that's us, right. here's everything that's not us. That's that's it. And, yeah. the, and the companies that I've dealt with that then came, you know, came in because of PCI, this particular type of data you care about. And this is what and they, they even get prescribed protect. exactly what data they should be caring about. The, yeah. the, yep. the, the, the PAN, the CVV2, the, the, the credit card data. And they still have problems understanding where it is, what they're doing with it, how they're processing it properly or not, and all this other stuff. Well, it's worse than that, it hasn't happened recently because I haven't done an assessment recently, but mm -hmm. asking a customer... I'm there because of PCI. I'm here because of your credit card data. Right. And I would ask a question like, what is the data we care about? Why are we here? What are we trying to secure? And they'd be like, seriously? Yeah. Oh, dear Lord. Yeah. So what so else? I'd, I'd have to prompt them. It's the credit card. 
data. <laughs> it's the cre- that's what just, we're worried about. Just credit card data. So you need what, just like a little flash was, card. Uh, credit card data. No, credit so, card data. Uh, yeah, I want more. But it, it, if I go through the goals of the PCI DSS, right? Cloud is going to tran- is, is going to get addressed in in a couple of the goal, a few of the goals, right? Build and maintain a secure network and systems. Cloud gets involved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, protect card cardholder data. Cloud's going to get involved. Maintain a vulnerability management program. Cloud's, Cloud's going to get involved, involved, right? And I think the definition of a vulnerability actually has to move up the stack as we think about applications and, and different components, not the traditional operating system, third-party software, okay. but it, it's going to have to So are you expand. talking about vulnerability by itself, or are you talking about vulnerability in terms of a pen test? Uh, it'll get interesting, right? Because the way they define <laughs> ah, that. Yes. Right? So I don't know that we want to go down that <laughs> rat hole yet. Um, implement strong access control into the cloud, into all these APIs and all these services, and regularly monitor and test networks. I mean, cloud has to get layered into those top five goals of the six major goals of PCI DSS. Cloud has to come in there in some form or fashion. So it'll be interesting to see how they structure so that. So that's a good segue to, you know, so what they said about cloud was it's, it's applicable and what everybody wants, I think Josh uh, you know, referred to it is, people want to know what they need to do to secure the cloud, mm-hmm. right? And, and who's responsible for what. Yep. And, and this is where you get into the love-hate relationship with the PCI Council. Yep. Um, they are very adamant about, and this is sort of a good news, bad news, good news type of scenario. Um, they are very adamant about not providing concrete, this is what you need to do, mm. step A, B, and C, or... You mean they're not going to uh, tell us that we need tripwires, FIM? No, not, <laughs> not, after, not after version 1.0. Right. They've learned their lesson. Um, so they're so, being descriptive, not prescriptive. Well, so that's sort of the bad news is they're not going to tell you, but that's to be expected. No, that's the good news. The, no, the, the good news is... In the, in the history of PCI, the, the way it worked, if you were going through an assessment, right. you are to meet all the different requirements. If you are uh, meeting a requirement, but not the way that it sort of loosely prescribes, uh, you're still allowed to meet the requirement, but you do it with what's called a compensating control. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. And the compensa- compensating control is predicated on, I sure hope you can filter out the roof construction. Yeah, <laughs> right. This thing. Um, the the um, the compensating control is pr- predicated on having some sort of business or technical restriction that prevents you from doing what PCI prescribes that you mm. do. Right. Um, so what they've advertised, and this is sort of the big news, is they are sort of more or less scrapping the idea of a compensating control, and they've come up with what they're calling, and let me go to the notes because I don't want to misstate it, they're calling it customized implementation. Mm. So you have the option of meeting the requirement, the way it's written, or if, you, if you're doing something else, but it meets the requirement, the spirit of the requirement, you're allowed to just simply meet the requirement. You don't have to write up a compensating control. You don't have to have the valid business or technical constraint. You're, you can just simply, I don't do it that way, I do it differently. And that's going to play out, I think, a lot in cloud, where people still want to have the cloud detail, meet the goals of the requirement, but it's just done differently in Mm. the cloud. And the council's not going to ever prescribe this is how you do it in the cloud or any other technology. They refer you to the expert in the room, which is the QSA. Mm. So the that's going to put the pressure on the QSA. Oh, absolutely. Right? So, so what they're the doing good is... News. Now here's the bad news right, on the back Right, because now what they're doing is they're shifting these custom implementations to be interpreted by the QSA to determine whether it meets the requirement or doesn't. So I'll tell and you that's going to require... Wait, there's more. Oh, oh okay. But I'll tell you what You're that's going to do. The QSA is now going to pass on the cost of that. So the QSA is going to walk in the door and go, you either write up the compensating controls, same as you used there to do. There are no compensating controls doesn't matter. It's, uh, you're going to write up the your com- explanation. You're going to write up, implement- implement- you're gonna write up your explanation of what you, you know, how you did X. Yep. Okay? If you write it up, I'm going to charge you X. I'm going to charge you this much for the, for the, for the uh, assessment. If you, if you want me to write it up, no problem. I'm going to charge you X plus or X times two or whatever. So this is where it gets tricky and where everybody was kind of scratching their heads. So it's kind of what Josh is describing. Um, 
they are they were stating that the the entity that's being assessed the merchant the whoever's right. going through this process yep. they can decide what they're going to do in terms of custom implementation right the assessor gets to determine what the testing procedures will be to validate mm. if what they're doing is an alternative approach meets it meets the standard or not. Which adds a customization into the whole QSA process. Because yep. first you have to get that data from the merchant, and then you're gonna have to decide how you're gonna validate those through your test, which is gonna change the scope client to client, right? Yep. So think about PC. Test, tester to tester. Tester to tester. Right, tester to tester. Well, now each company is gonna have a standard set of tests because it's going to because they're not necessarily gonna, not necessarily oh, but well, they, I guarantee they, it. I, at some well, point they will, they will. they're going to yeah. have a, an exactly. a la carte of because what's going to happen is if, let's say there's three different things you have to do whatever mm -hmm. x y and z mm -hmm. and i have uh three different qsacs qsa companies okay yep and company one says to do x y and z we have tests one two and three company two says for x y and z we have tests four five and six seven eight and nine and his tester says, I've got my special test that I run on this stuff. It's test 10, you know, whatever. And test 10 works fine until they have a breach, and then they come back and they, hit, they go after the QSAC's error and omissions insurance, because remember, now it's on the QSAC. Mm -hmm. And the QSA, who's a member or, or, or an employee of the QSAC, mm -hmm. the error and omission insurance co uh, company is going to come and say, well, how did you test for that, uh, uh, that, that process, that, that piece done properly? Well, we have a default test. Is that what you did? No, I did my own special test. Right. Oh. And you're and you're picking up on the same thing that I picked up on is how are you going to validate and justify all of this? Because yeah. is it going to be the wild, wild west like we it'll talked about on the drive up? Like it wasn't where the, anything goes. But it was in the early, early days of PCI because you and I were there in the early, early days. Mm -hmm. Right. I was building. They're the, old. Right, yeah, well, I am old. Um, I love being the youngest one in the room. The next time I'm in studio, <laughs> I'm you right you'll, you'll all know how old I am. But <laughs> when we were building the early program when I was at Acuvant, right, it was kind of the Wild West. It was PCI 1.0, 1.1. I mean, it was really early. What you've seen over the last 15 or so years is that companies have, have kind of built how they're going to test for the report on compliance, right, mm -hmm. the rock at the mm -hmm. end of the day. And they've made that really cookie cutter in a statement of work. Mm -hmm. Now what's going to happen is that cookie cutter process that has been matured and refined over the past 15 years, part of that gets thrown out the window and it's going to be the Wild West again. So you're yeah. going to have like your standard s statement of work. Then you're going to have, based on any custom implementations, all these variations of how you test against them to produce the report on compliance. Which is what we were talking about a minute ago, where yeah. if you want me to explain it, no problem. It's going to take me three extra weeks. Here's what we're going to charge you for that. It's, it's going to take a lot of extra time, effort, and money. Versus me, where I'm a chop shop, you know, one-stop chop shop. You know, shoot, I can do that and. I can do that in 20 minutes versus his three weeks. And the variance between the data that's collected for both the yeah. tests. You know, there's going to be a rating be of huge. QSACs. Yeah. It's going to be this. Get it, 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 You're not sure that your stuff meets conditions? Get this QSAC. They're going to be easier to get through. Well, and there's always been at least the perception that if you don't like the QSA company you have, they're, they're, not, they're holding you to the fire in a way that you don't like you fire them you go find somebody else that's right. just going to accept it that's well because you go sort of you, you go there. to the company we won't name on this show because <laughs> they'll just cookie cutter it and push you through mm -hmm. the process well, right? what's the old adage when you when you are trying to get through to a call center right you keep calling until you get the answer you want right right it, the same thing is going to happen here yeah and the it interesting will, thing is now with the have procedures, to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Much with the more. procedures and the 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 shifting not sh not shifting of the blame, but the shifting of the responsibilities that you're talking right. about, and the customization availabilities that you're talking about, mm -hmm. it's going to be much easier for less than ethical individuals and companies to basically pass a lot of risk along to the consumer, to the banks, various places like that. PCI sweatshops. Well, PC, well, yeah, I mean... Uh, like the pen test sweatshops. The pen test sweatshops that are out there. Maybe, uh, but in some ways, I think it, it's also... And they didn't say this, but this was sort of the... Some of the, the scuttlebutt that was going around, people I was talking to, was that maybe this is an attempt for them to try to squash a lot of the cookie-cutter, not 
not so reputable, a highly commoditized, com commoditized yeah. version. That's such of a nice way of saying that. Matt. Well done. <laughs> the issues uh, I highly see, commoditized. in addition to these, are you know something does happen. How do you validate that everything was adequate? Right. And where's the blame fall when a breach happens after oh. a QSAC Ooh. did and the report on compliance? I mean, just think about the, the back and forth. Again, back to the early days mm -hmm. when these breaches happened, when they were supposedly PCI compliant, but yet they still got breached. Son of a I, breach. I got another one. So, oh, goof. <laughs> so um, okay, let's assume that a QSAC comes in, does their whole battery of customized tests that are defaulted to the company. They're doing it properly. And then there's a breach. The insurance company, the, the council comes by, like, what's going on? Well, we were tested. We were audited. We were properly done. We, we were compliant, blah, blah, blah. Excuse me. We shall never use that audit word in a discussion of PCI <laughs> on this show. <laughs> compliant? No, the word audit. We don't audit. We they assess and That's because they're not CPAs. Even though the whole PCI community is Look, my father in law and they've gone over to audit. My yeah. father-in-law is the CPA of InfoSec, okay? So I understand the difference between auto, audit and assess, so I mm -hmm. apologize. I, he, he'll yell at me. And then my it's wife a hill that I'm dying on. Yeah, but stop hanging on the subject already, uh, okay? Uh, but, but <laughs> no, in all seriousness, wait, wait. So here's the thing. Those customized tests for the various pieces of PCI, okay? The first time there's a breach... Everybody's going to go, well, give us your tests. How did you test? Right. Those customized tests are now going to be open to the world. Yeah. And so you can't claim them as intellectual property. All of the effort you put into them is now open sourced effectively. And it's going to be fascinating to see companies try to hide them. That's an interesting observation because I was wondering, not so much from the breach perspective, but from the, you know, the PCI council is supposed to be vetting the QSAs, vetting mm -hmm. the QSA companies. They review a certain amount of work output. They review the rocks and they, they evaluate the assessors. Right, right. And how do you do that if all these different assessors are coming up with different types of solutions? Right, right. right. One to address one the, things how do you like standardize cloud. and measure that? Right. One of, the main, one of the main staples of compliance is to try to measure corporate activities on a standardized practice, mm -hmm. right? So if you're throwing this monkey wrench in, how are you going to validate what is and what is not the standard practice? Is that, is that like... I think that's part of it. I mean, how do you evaluate... The standard practice They have their change. established, if you do these things, mm -hmm. we, we acknowledge that you're meeting the objective of whatever the requirement is. How do you do that? And, and I'll put it more succinctly, and this is my pet peeve with the, with the PCI Council. Uh, I was a QSA for 10 years in the days where they accepted work experience to qualify you. They abandoned that with the introduction of version 3, so five, six years ago, and they first started requiring that you had to have the CISSP certification. In the last year, they've added a second certification. CISA, I think. CISA. Yeah. Certified CISA. Certified Information Security Auditor. Security, Security Auditor. Auditor. Yeah. So even they've caved to the whole concept of audit. My question is simply, and this was the first question I thought when they pitched this, is like, hmm, I wonder what certification they're going to add now that's going to qualify people to make, go out and make all these really intelligent decisions about what's a valid alternative custom approach and how you test its valid validity. Security Plus. Oh, I'm going to hit you. There it is. <laughs> no, actually, do you know what it's going to be? Seriously? JD. Because not only are you going to have to <laughs> write these tests, yep. validate that these tests are valid and reliable, very important, mm -hmm. but you've also got to get them passed legal. Because remember, the minute that you write a customized test to, to certify or assess mm -hmm. that a company is doing something proper within PCI, the minute a breach happens, the minute a problem happens, the minute anything happens, it's going to go to court. Well, shouldn't be legal, like, it shouldn't, I'm sorry, let me rephrase, shouldn't legal be part of the PCI process? But now it's, it's the QSA's legal, yeah, and they're going to have to charge. Legal. No, I'm talking about the, the, the legal for the business. Yeah, but it's but, different. But it's because not. now what you're doing is you're hiring an external firm to do the certification. Certification responsibility now sits on the, the company, the QSA company. The firm, the external the firm, firm, yeah. And, and now that firm has to think about the legal impacts of its customized implementation tests and whether they will hold up in a court of law. And so you're adding cost to the QSAC, you're adding time to the QSAC. Yep. They are not being currently compensated under their current rates. So what, we should, what I'm hearing is under PCI version four, costs for performing your QSACs uh, to bring in a QSA mm -hmm. and perform your assessment, thank you, yep. are going to go through the roof. 
you will expect them just, to go cost. up. Not but just cost, but also time as if well. If you're doing the customized right. approach, doesn't I mean, matter. But there, I think it you're going to doesn't no, matter. It does matter if you're if you're still going by the if book. You're going by the book on the rest the of the stuff. You're fine. It's still commoditized. Mm -hmm. It's where the cloud stuff comes in, where there's levels of interpretation I'm gonna and be, testing. This is where it gets. I'm going to put ten dollars down on a bet with you, sir, and okay. you, that the costs once 4.0 comes in and people start adjusting to it, costs for across the board assessments. Thank you, Jeff. Are going to go up. Period. Now that being said, is there any room for an over under on that? Sure, go for it. <laughs> um, well, I think for I mean, the QSA companies out there, there's certainly business opportunity, not only in charging to develop the, the validation and the testing requirements to validate the customized approach, but I could also see a, an advisory service. Let us help you craft what the appropriate custom and uh, even if you then, don't then we go then we go back to some very interesting uh, separation of duties, right? If you yeah. guide them, then you really can't come in back in and do the assessment. And then we get back into the old discussion of can a QSA come in and advise and then come in and do the assessment work or do, or should they be two separate firms? Right. This is where in the early days there's a lot of debate around this and I think later versions addressed aspects of this but now we're back into that cycle potentially again yep. okay yep. i'm betting on a 30 percent rise in qsa costs or more across the board and the reason is even if you do it by the book they just like a hospital i may have you coming in for a a, a, a big toe boil or whatever but i'm going to charge you 50 bucks for that aspirin because i got to pay for the guy down the street you know the, the guy in the ward down there that can't afford much so i'm just going to raise my costs for everything to, to level set all of the costs. Hmm. I'm betting for a 30% or more increase, to be honest with you. That's I, what I'm gonna I, I don't disagree with that. I, I guess I envision, you know, a surge, a tsunami that will come. I don't know when, don't get me wrong. And, and, but it, eventually it'll level out and then maybe, you know. And then there's PCI 5.0 will beach. change it all again. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I actually, I actually want to get in on that bet okay. and say that, say that price is not going to change. But what is going to change is the level of service. Oh, no, that's interesting. I disagree, but that's interesting. Um, done. <laughs> okay, that's easy. <laughs> All right, bet done. So All right, stay tuned for a future episode <laughs> yeah, right. where we, where we go back and we settle the bets. And we'll see what it is. What else came into so the 4 That was the discussion. highlights. Uh, those were the big items. So uh, passwords and cloud were passwords, the two. Passwords, clouds, and the big in terms of examples of we're going to be changing the and rules. Customization the, and the customization. The customization is yeah. certainly the biggest aspect. And then they reviewed, okay, when's this all going to happen? So they are, in October of 2019, going to release the draft version of 4.0 for comment, they're calling it RFC, request for comment. Right. So they're gonna have a several month, I think October, November, maybe it'll close by December, where everybody that's involved and interested can read through it and put in their two cents. They're gonna review that throughout Q1 of 2020, and in Q2 of 2020, they're planning for a second round of requests for comment. So okay. they'll put out a revised draft, see if everybody is happy with what they tweaked, and then, they, you know, they will never say an exact date, but it, it seems like they're tracking towards, you know, Q3, Q4. Yeah, of second 2020 half of 2020 is when they're going to drop four zero. So when companies are doing their second pen test for PC. Oh, stop <laughs> it! <laughs> no, okay, I, I, I couldn't help that. I mean, it's it's a great idea. You know, it, companies could sh should do uh, continuous monitoring, continuous testing, right? But Wait, the question to is, to give is, context, we had an argument, Jeff yeah, and I, about. We did. It. There was there was, was an a draft. argument. I just had to set you straight. That's all. <laughs> I was correct. <laughs> no, you weren't. Yes, I was. There was a draft of PCI 3.2 no, that said semi-annual pen testing. You found a there, blog. Where that was what I found it. on the drive, the first link, and I told you. Did that. you find a draft? I haven't had a chance. I okay. will go find it for you later. So I'm not wrong until you find a draft that said there was a. Re it might a be in four zero. Jeff, has anybody ever called you inflexible? He's uh, saying, Josh, yes. Josh, what he's really saying is My that wife. He, he rejects your reality and he substitutes his own. Ah, uh, that works. Well, I went right to the standard and it says annual pen test. Right. He is technically correct, which is the best kind of correct. Where there is correct. an opportunity for continuous pen testing is the, 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 or, the and or of the requirement is you do an annual pen test and you do a pen test after a significant change to your network or your environment. Right. Okay. Which arguably... And you know they're not going to. If define. your DevOps means often, <laughs> often, 
you know, what constitutes a significant change? But PCI what constitutes a pen it. test as well? Don't even get me started. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's close it there. <laughs> yeah, let's close it there. So that's the highlights of, of, of the community meeting, the introduction to PCI 4.0. We're going to take a quick break, come back and talk about news from security and compliance for the past week. <laughs>